Hi everyone, and welcome to another web meetup of Iron Run Center UK. So today we are, in a way, continuing from last week's discussion. Last week we discussed the so-called cancel culture, and some of the themes will also be discussed today. So today we're joined by two guests, uh, Greg Salmieri. Greg is a senior scholar of philosophy in the Salem Center at the University of Texas, Austin. And he has written a lot. He, he's the editor of the companion to Ayn Rand, to mention some of the things. And he will help us uh, discuss this issue. But also we have with us Brendan O'Neill. Brendan is the editor of online magazine Spiked. And together we'll discuss some of the themes that mostly have to do with how do we deal with people who, with whom we disagree and how do we do it in a way that A, is productive, but also in a way that is not, let's say, morally relativistic. Because there are two bad choices here. The one is the choice to say, well, this person has bad views, so he should get fired, he should go off Twitter, he should get canceled. And the second, bad extreme, not extreme. The second bad option is to say, well, you know, ideas don't really matter. Let's all be friends. Let's discuss. Yeah, maybe, you know, you're a Holocaust denier, but it's okay. Let's discuss it. Maybe, you know, there's some merit here, some merit there. So the difficult, the difficult thing to, to make sure to, to the, the difficult thing is how do we have these discussions when we don't throw away judgment, but also we keep a level of civil discourse and respect toward the other side. So these are the themes of today. So the format is the usual. Greg is going to start with the short introduction. Then Brendan is going to tell us his view on the topic. And then we're open for discussion. You can do two things. You can either raise your hands by the Zoom fu function. You go to participants, raise your hand. Or I'll also try to monitor the chat. Now, hopefully, you're not going to get canceled for being related to us. But if you're particularly rewarded, you can make sure that your camera is not on. If you want to ask a question, you can put it on the chat. But I'm sure nothing bad is going to happen. OK, so without further delay, Greg. Yeah, I think these questions of what are the right terms to engage with people on that are both reflect moral seriousness about your judgments but also respect the particular people you're dealing with and the context in which you're dealing with them are, are the right way to think about a lot of issues that are now instead posed in terms of free speech. Um, whatever Twitter's policies might be, or Facebook's policies, or any of these other companies' policies, or the policies of Spiked Magazine, or the Ayn Rand Center UK, or whatever it is, these are not violations of free speech. If you only let people talk who hold a certain view or who wear their hair a certain way or whatever it is, that is, um, some of those policies might be really dumb or bad or misguided or immoral, but they're not issues of free speech. What free speech is, is the political right that enables each person to speak his mind on his own property, his own dime, uh, determine who to associate with and what kinds of conversations or exchanges to get involved with. And any kind of, of these content policies you might have uh, are expressions of the free speech of the person who sets the policy, not violations of it. But then there were questions of, okay, well, what should those policies be? If you're running a newspaper, you're running a university, you're running a meetup group, what is the right policies to have? Because uh, a lot of policies are dumb and counterproductive. And I think there, there are a couple of principles, um, but I think the central one is you want to think about what your purpose is. Why, are you ha why does this body exist? And what purpose does, does the discussion that you're engaged in, um, uh, how does that relate to the purpose of the, the body if you're running an organization? Or if you're an individual deciding who to speak to and how to deal with him, what's your purpose in, in wanting to engage in this conversation? And I think what policies you'll have, who you'll relate to and how you relate to them, are going to be very different depending on your purpose. If you're like an advocacy organization, you're going to want to have a very different view, a very different relationship to people who are opposed to the thing you're advocating for 
than if you're not an advocacy uh, organization. Uh, if you're a newspaper, you're going to have certain values that are central to you, but it's going to be important to your mission to canvas the range of different opinions. And so it's going to be more important to you to find terms on which you could have different people there. And I think we really have to think about what are the central values that we individuals, organizations are committed to? And then how does it reflect those values to engage with people that we disagree with, either about those very values, in some cases, or about derivative matters that are, aren't you know, our central mission in life, but, um, but are really important to us? And then if you do that, I think part of respecting somebody is saying, look, we really disagree. And that disagreement is important. And it's not like I defend, defend free speech, so I'm happy to talk to you and to treat whatever our disagreements are as though they're trivial and matters of little importance because we both agree with free speech. Uh, I'm doing this as one of the panelists with Brendan. I don't know his views super well, but from what I've looked up, it seems like there are some things we agree on and a lot of things we really disagree on. And I don't know if in the end we're on the same side or the opposite side fundamentally. And I don't think a premise of our talking should be we basically agree and the stuff we disagree about are matters of detail, but we're on the same side as opposed to whoever it is that is the bogeyman of the moment. Uh, it's we should respect each other enough to say we might disagree about things that are really important, even about some that make one of us or both of us judge the other to be a bad person. But we know that part of intellectual engagement part of your own self-development, part of communicating to an audience, part of being objective in all these fields is to sometime engage with, engage with people who have different views from yours, um, to value the existence of some forums for doing that. Not every organization needs to be a forum, but some do. And then to engage on those terms with it. And that's how I think about engagement. And it's how I think about it for different organizations I'm involved with, some of which are... Um, advocacy groups for certain positions, and it's really important we only have a kind of limited range of people talking on this channel, and others of which are, you know, opportunities for much broader engagement. So I think that's enough for a, an opening remark. The, the kind of essential idea is um, keep in mind what your purpose is and what the value of this engagement is for you as an individual and for whatever organizations you're involved in thinking about the policies for. Thank you. So, Brenda. Um, okay, when I think about respect and judgment in public debate and political life, there's one idea I really disagree with. I really disagree with the idea that the problem we face at the moment is that there's too much tension, there's too much polarization, there's too much name calling, there are too many ugly terms uh, uh, and all those kinds of accusations that are, uh, or criticisms that are very regularly made about the state of public life today. I disagree with that because for the fundamental reason that political life for a very, very long time has always had that phenomenon in it. And it's very often been a very useful clarifying phenomenon. I mean, if you go back to the English Civil War, for example, in the mm -hmm. 1640s, when there was an explosion of public debates, pamphleteering, people discussing things in pubs, and of course, people clashing in the streets and in the fields of England. Um, public debate was incredibly tense. It was very divisive. People were called the most obnoxious names. People were divided very clearly into two camps and they would propagandize against each other all the time. Or if you go forward to the 1700s and the great uh, warrior for liberty, John Wilkes, who was a defender of press freedom in the English context, um, he would publish the most obscene pamphlets and newspapers, uh, you know, about bishops and members of the royal family and so on, uh, precisely as a way of stirring up controversy and precisely as a way of defending freedom of speech at its limits. Um, and people lapped it up, people loved it, people loved an opportunity to read incredibly salacious stuff and very rude stuff about figures in authority. And then, of course, in the 19th century, with the various struggles for uh, democracy and the expansion of the franchise, public debate was not polite. You know, those gatherings in Hyde Park, in, in what would subse subsequently become Speaker's Corner, these were uh, intense discussions, horrible things were said. And if you go to Speaker's Corner now, it's, it's similar. 
Um, in fact, you can't go now because it's still locked down, I think. But if you went at any time over the recent period, you would see people saying the most obnoxious things about Islam or white people or whatever else it might be. And I think that's all par for the course in, in public life. And I think that's actually fine. And historically speaking, at least, that kind of often quite intemperate political debate was incredibly useful in clarifying where the divide was in society and what was at stake in public life. And so one thing I, I really disagree with, when people say that it's unhelpful to, to scream Ramona at, at, at you know, hardcore Remainers, I really disagree with that. If people um, say that you, you know, there are certain terms of abuse you shouldn't use online, and if you use them, you should be banned, I disagree with that. I think it's important to recognize that historically speaking, politics has been very often impolite and often usefully impolite. Uh, and I think it's really worth remembering that. The problem today, as I see it, is actually a bit more of a subtle one, which is, um, I think, the way I understand it is that historically, intemperate, disrespectful political debate was often reflective of the high stakes in political life. And I think the difference today is that disrespectful, intemperate debate is often reflective more of the narcissism of small differences. And it's sometimes, it's, it springs from a shallowness and a fear of disagreement rather than, from, rather than springing from a deep political conflict in which there are incredibly high stakes. So if you just look at, um, for example, on, on the internet or in, in public life more broadly, I think the key problem today is, is the presumption of immorality if someone disagrees with you. So today, if someone disagrees with you, it, 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 you, it's no longer enough to say that they are wrong. It's no longer enough to engage them in a debate and try to change their mind. It's no longer even enough to, to point at them and say, this person's wrong for the following reasons. There's now a presumption that they are evil, that they are. Uh, that this is a, a, a wicked force in society and nothing can be done except to silence it. So. One of the key problems, I think, in public debate now is this complete unwillingness to entertain the possibility that the person who disagrees with you profoundly on some issue might be doing so in good faith and might have good arguments. And instead, there's this rush to say, to, to look for the secret prejudiced force driving this person's point of view. So if you're a feminist and you don't want male bodied people in your changing rooms, that's no longer seen as a legitimate point of view or something that we should talk about. It's seen as transphobia. Or if you are a Christian and you are opposed to same-sex marriage because you think it's ridiculous for people of the same sex to get married and it undermines the whole point of marriage, that's no longer seen as a legitimate Christian point of view. That's seen as homophobia. Um, if you criticize any aspect of the Quran, or if you even raise concerns about Islamic terrorism, which has been a pretty serious problem in Western Europe for the last five years, that's written off very often as Islamophobia. So there's this knee-jerk assumption that people are saying things because they are phobic, they're mentally disordered in some way. Phobia, after all, is a, is a mental ailment. It's an irrational fear. Um, they're evil, they're wicked. Uh, there could not possibly be any meaningful uh, uh, sentiment here or any real purpose to what they're saying. So the problem there is that debate itself becomes impossible in those circumstances. It's literally impossible to have debate. And that's why I think cancel culture and other phenomena like that ha have risen up because when debate is, uh, is pointless, then it is completely inevitable that new forms of censor censorship will emerge to ensure that debate never takes place. So cancel culture and political correctness and, and woke intolerance, I think, are, are pretty much just functions of think, something that had already been existing for a long time, which is a presumption of um, not simply wrongness on the part of the person who disagrees with you, but wickedness and therefore a desire to expel them from your circle or your sphere and possibly from public life more broadly. So. We have to go back to first principles, I think. I think we, we, we should defend name calling and intemperance and argumentation and um, you know difficult ideas and um, angry people. I think we should defend all of those things in the name of freedom of speech. 
but we have to go back to the fundamental principle that debate is possible and that people hold all sorts of views in good faith. And I think approaching people with that outlook, with the, with the recognition that, what they're say, that they really believe what they're saying, would really radically transform public life in the 21st century. Uh, the final point I would make just to throw in a slight disagreement with, with Gregory, I, I actually do think, um, I do think that the speech codes and the speech policies that exist in social media in particular um, represent an, an attack on freedom of speech. And I know this puts me at odds somewhat with the Ayn Rand guys, which is that um, I think an individual's freedom of speech is, should take precedence over a corporation's property rights. And the reason I say that is because when, when you live in a world in which private companies dominate public debate to such an extraordinary degree, which Twitter, Facebook and Instagram and other outlets do, then I do think it's legitimate to expect them to subject themselves to um, social norms. And I think the most important social norm is freedom of speech and freedom of thought. And I would not be opposed to putting public pressure on these private companies to respect freedom of speech, um, certainly within the law of the nations in which they operate. I don't think they should break national law, but they should err on the side of freedom of speech as much as possible because they've become such key players in public life. But more broadly, I think the key point I would make about respect and judgment in public life and debate and, and going forward with how to debate people, the starting point has to be that when you encounter someone, unless they're completely crazy, we should start from the standpoint that they mean what they say, they really believe it. They might even have a good idea that will help us to change our minds. You know, Thomas Paine's view that one of the great liberties is the liberty to change your own mind. And if we approach public debate like that, I think we can really start to have a more fruitful, free, and possibly angry, argumentative public square. Thank you. So I think one issue that came up is the issue of what actually is censorship, but I will leave this for, for later. Maybe someone from the audience can pick it up. I want to ask a question to both of you, and it has to do with whether political differences could be detrimental to your friendship with someone. And something, Brennan said something interesting, that the stakes today are completely at odds with, with how how the level of the tension in the public sphere. So I had a, a former girlfriend of mine, her grandfather had fought in the Greek civil war with the royalists and his neighbor had fought with the communists. Now that was, a, if you know anything about the Greek political history, this was basically 30 years that these people were on, literally on, the, on different sides of barricades quite often, or the one was in prison because of the policies of the other. Now, these people uh, remain friends. These people would go together, would spend the whole day together. They would argue all the time. They would fight for politics. And the only time they'd come together is when they'd go to the cafe to watch Olympiacos because they were both Olympiacos fans. Now, there are two ways to, to view this. The one is to say, oh, look how beautiful this is. Friendship is above politics. But the other way is, do these people really take ideas seriously? Because if you are so fundamentally opposed to someone in terms of your wor worldview, what kind of world you want to live in, what should be the direction that Greece should take, then can you be friends with that person? And I've always struggled to find, oh, my instinct was that this was very beautiful, but I was struggling to find, does this mean something about not taking ideas seriously? So Greg and Brendan, if you can comment on that, on whether you can actually be friends with someone you fundamentally disagree with and the ideas of whom you consider comp really immoral and uh, and wrong i don't think you can if we include all of the things you said in the in the uh, the list that is um we're not just talking about somebody who holds an idea among the many ideas they hold that you regard as fundamentally immoral and wrong uh, but they also hold a lot of other ones that you regard as fundamentally moral and right, and their life's a kind of hodgepodge of these things. If we're talking about someone like that, you could have, I think, a, a positive relationship with them, a friendship that is um, 
based around the things you have in common. But if we're talking about someone whose whole life is dedicated to something, this is the central thing they're doing with their life, they're spending all their time doing it, what a good day is for them is when this thing is going well. And you regard that thing as evil. I think there's a certain kind of respect you could have for a person like that as an adversary or something, but I don't think you could have a real friendship. And if you do, I think either you or they is not taking the idea seriously enough. Now, in the case of your these two friends that you talk about, you know, I don't know, are, are they maintaining this friendship while the war is going on? Or is this, you know, years after the, the thing and they have in common now that both of their views are kind of passe and they're old fighters from the past war? That I could see happening. But if they're actually, you know, the guy's out shooting at the one guy, the in the morning and then at night they get together for a beer. Yeah, I don't think that's friendship. Right. Brendan, could um, you be friends with, uh, you know, the most uh, fanatical guardianista who is against free speech? Um, I don't know. I think it would be difficult. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's particularly helpful to politicize personal life or to personalize political life. I think it's worth keeping a barrier between those two things as much as possible. And I think one of the great problems of the modern era is the idea that the personal is political, uh, which comes from feminism, but expresses a broader idea that your own life, your own personhood, your own experiences, every single aspect of them is political. I think the danger with that is that it encourages people to see themselves as a political being and therefore they approach everyone else in the same way. And that probably makes friendship and social engagement more difficult across the board. Um, you know, I would struggle to have a close friendship with a hardcore Remainer um, because, you know, in the United Kingdom, uh, in like a, a peaceful echo of the civil war years, you know, the country has been completely divided along the lines of Leavers and Remainers. Um, and in that conflict, by the way, I think the stakes are incredibly high. I think there are still conflicts in which the stakes are very high. Um, and that's one of them wh where the difference of opinion is between the fundamental constitutional matter of how the country should be governed. The, the, I think the reason that's an important example and your Greek civil war example is important too, is there unquestionably comes a time in political life when normal political discourse no longer works. Um, I mean, war is the clearest example of that. War happens because normal discourse and law and the, the typical way of resolving differences no longer works, either because the stakes have risen too highly or institutions have fallen into disrepute, or whatever the reason might be, usually because the stakes are so high that political life cannot manage them. Um, and I think there are instances in public life when the stakes become so high or the divide becomes so deep that normal political discourse can't uh, hold it together. And it does turn into something else. It does turn into a, a, a divide through which people define themselves. I meet people all the time who define themselves as Remainers or Leavers, or even worse, a divide in which um, there is actual physical conflict. So. We have to prepare ourselves for that fact and that truth and um, allow that, I think, as part of a more honest form of political discourse where we recognize this reality that tensions are often so high that you can't just sit around and have a cup of coffee and reach consensus. I really despise the modern obsession with consensus. I'm suspicious of every consensus building institution. I always think that's incredibly dishonest and it's always consensus on the part of the, the side that is most in tune with the establishment. I think sometimes consensus is a very bad idea and conflict is far preferable. And if we accept that, then I think we will start to get to the thing I'm interested in, which is a more honest form of discussion in which we recognize that there are, that people hold their opinions honestly and that it's very difficult to bring people together. Sometimes they have to just slog it out. Yeah, and quite often consensus means, well, I don't take ideas too seriously, so who cares? Let's be friends and anyway, I have more questions, but I let's go to, of, oh, sorry, um, Greg, yes. Um, so um, on the, the uh, personal is political slogan, um, the kind of feminist slogan, as you put it, Brendan, uh, I think of it more the other way around than how I view it. Um, that is not from how you're viewing it, but from how the feminists are. I think if you're doing politics right, the political should be personal. 
Um, that is, if you have a political conviction, it should be because you understand that your personal values, your life is served by a certain kind of society and you're trying to achieve that society. And so if somebody's trying to destroy it um, or bought by your light is destroy it, um, you should you know, feel personally injured by that. But you also have to hold that in context. Maybe they're making an honest mistake. Maybe they're doing other things that are, um, you know, maybe that's not the whole truth about them. So you want to put it in context. The other comment is, and this pertains to, Brandon, both of your last um, um, segments that I've been thinking about, it, is the idea of honest disagreement. Because I think on a lot of... Um, a lot of a lot of the political disagreement I think we see in our societies I don't think is honest, but what it means for it to be and I don't think is innocent, but what it means for it to be dishonest or not innocent to me isn't that someone's lying about what they're holding, um, and you know, they've got some secret agenda behind the scenes and that's what they're advancing, but there's something. Um, not motivated by caring about the truth and that and by prioritizing the truth in their own thinking. And I think that that's something we ought to morally evaluate other people for, and we ought to morally evaluate ourselves when we see it in ourselves. So I think it's, I worry about a dichotomy where someone's either in good faith and reasonable, and then we should embrace them and debate with them, or they're not, in which case they're a monster and we can never talk to them. I want to be able to say, look, there's something wrong, including morally wrong, with what this guy's saying. However, in some circumstances, it's still a good idea for me to have a discussion with him. And maybe I'll push him and make him see that he's got, you know, to really face some moral issue, or maybe I'll make the audience see it, uh, or maybe I'll learn that I'm wrong. But it, it shouldn't be there's any immorality in the other guy. Therefore, there's no context in which we can have a discussion. Otherwise, I think you are only you're limiting discussion to things that you think aren't that important or aren't that morally. Uh, before we go to Nancy, uh, Brennan will reply soon. But one thing, Razi, you have made me co-host in the wrong account, so I cannot unmute people. So make me on the other one, the, the one from my laptop. Sorry, Brendan. And then when I get the proper control, we go to the to the audience. Brendan. Uh, yeah, I agree uh, with what Gregory has just said there, in fact, and um, I think actually the most one of the most important things about freedom of speech is that it is, in my view, the only mechanism through which, well, as, as, as Milton put it, 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 truth and falsehood do battle, and his belief was that truth would always win because he had trust in freedom and he had trust in people's capacity to sort truth from falsehood. So um, even where someone is... Uh, even where we think someone is motivated by bad faith or is promoting what is quite clearly a conspiracy theory or is spreading falsehoods, you know, these are all morally questionable things to do. Even there, I think freedom of speech is, is definitely the, uh, the best way to engage with that stuff and to, to, you know, let truth and falsehood grapple and truth will out if we treat that process seriously. So I think um, freedom of speech is the most important mechanism for getting to the truth of the matter. Um, in relation to the personal is political, I mean, it's absolutely right that uh, an individual can fold him or herself into a political cause or a political value system to such an extent that they see themselves as a core part of that. And I think that's happened throughout history. You know, for a very long time, people define themselves as left wing or right wing. And, you know, that would often run through pretty much everything they did in their lives in terms of what they did in the workplace, whether they hung out at a working men's club or a conservative association bar. I mean, it, you know, if you fold yourself into a political outlook in that way, then your personal life gets tied up in it. And I think that's absolutely fine uh, and often very good, in fact, to, to um, devote yourself to a cause. The problem with the personal is political from the 1970s onwards and particularly today is really through the, the politics of identity because what the politics of identity does, it says that your identity is political. So your genitals are political, your sexual preferences are political, your skin color is political. And the problem there is that that's not an individual devoting him or herself to a cause bigger than him or herself. That is, that is a, a, an extraordinary culture of narcissism where you see your own 
hang-ups essentially as being uh, incredibly political and incredibly important and what it also means is that anyone who criticizes your politics of identity it, that's interpreted as an attack on the self that's interpreted as an existential assault on the individual because their whole personhood has been politicized by themselves um, that's why you have trans activists talking about being erased you know this melodramatic language where anyone who criticizes the right of a male-bodied person to go into a woman's changing room for example or a woman's domestic violence shelter trans activists will say you're erasing us and the reason they have this quite melodramatic language is because if you personal if you politicize your personal identity to such an extraordinary degree then you will start to interpret any form of criticism or even any form of debate as an attack uh, uh, almost as a genocide against you as an individual and you have this incredibly irrational response that's why we had a british labor mp this week um, talking about transgender issues in parliament and saying we must stop fetishizing debate and, and she put debate in quote marks because debate is now seen as a necessarily threatening, violent act, precisely because we have so many people who have politicized their personal identities. So I think maintaining it's a distinction between your personal identity and political life is important. But if you willingly and consciously want to devote a huge amount of your personal life to a political cause, that's absolutely fine. Nancy, unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I agree with I agree with uh, what Brendan just said, and I think um, the thing that I've I've been thinking is that um, it was possible to uh, be friendly with political opponents easier in the past because even if you disagreed violently, you still shared uh, a sense of what a good life was composed of you shared a sense of wanting the same things, even if you disagreed about how to get them, and even if you wanted to get them at the expense of someone else. Um, and I think what <clears throat> has happened and what we need to reckon with is that since the 1970s, um, certain basic assumptions have changed on, and we can't take that for granted anymore. So we are really in an existential a struggle so for example, um, you can see in, in um, I think probably the clearest example is in environmentalism, where you used to have a consensus that it was good uh, not to de destroy the environment because you wanted to serve human beings. And now you have a strand of that that is deeply anti-human and thinks that human beings are just um, a parasite on the planet. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think it's just so important that we can tease these things out because on the one hand, there is, um, there are, there is a, a perspective that wants to perpetuate a human project that is linked and connected to the past, to the present and to the future. And there is one, which is the one about identity that is focused on your best life in the present. And insofar as there is any collective purpose, it is to serve uh, the uh, recognition and validation of people's identities. And it's just, it's just impossible to challenge that unless you can actually uh, 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 pick apart what people are saying because sometimes things sound superficially the same. And what is very important, you mentioned something important. No, you mentioned many important things, but one that really struck me is you said that people could share a level of understanding. To date, it looks like people don't even talk the same language anymore. Because if you believe that this, your mind, works in a different way based on whether you're a man or a woman, for example, or black or white, then it means that me and you do not even talk the same language. It's like the Tower of Babel. We, we, we talk, but the one cannot understand the other. That's why I will add to what Brennan said, that identity politics really makes impossible to have debate because it destroys the tool for debate, which is reason and language. But anyway, uh, Brennan I, and Greg, comments on this, on Nancy's points. I disagree that this is something that's changed since the 70s. I think um, it's moved around where the worst elements of it are. But I mean, 
if you're thinking about like, you know, Knight Rider clansmen and the people that supported them and black people trying to do better in the US and the Better Business Bureau and the like if you think about the different political factions in America in the 1890s or the 1910s um uh, I mean, it's not like those people were all uh, had the same view of what the good life is and were talking to one another about it. And if you think about the, the Khmer Rouge slaughtering people and so forth, uh, I don't think, um, you know, uh, things were, were, there was a kind of consensus there that's lacking now. Um, so I think there are just times when things are really bad and times when they're really good and times that are in between. And with respect to different issues and places and parts of society, things shift. And I think the, the essence there is even identity, I think, is secondary to what the, the kind of fundamental thing is that differentiates uh, when people can deal with one another productively and cooperatively, even in disagreement, and when they can't. And it's, in, I think there are two types of motivations that people have. There's a kind of motivation that comes from using your mind, thinking about your own life, trying to project what kind of life you want and what you want to achieve for yourself. And if you have enemies or things that you're opposed to or things that you want to join, they're all posterior to that. You're thinking, this is what I want to make of my life. This is what I do what I want to do with my life. This is what I want to accomplish. I need certain things and certain social conditions for that to happen. And therefore, I'm for these causes and opposed to those. But the primary is you and your values and the values you're trying to achieve for yourself in the world. And the opposite of that is a mentality where you're primarily striking back or lashing out at things. You're seeing yourself not as the author of your life. You're seeing yourself as someone who's fundamentally a victim and has to defend against things that um, you worry harm you. And it's that motivation that makes people reflectively reflexively get into identity groups, whether they're identity groups based on your economic class, like the proletariat and the bourgeois and so forth, or identity groups based on your racial characteristics or your gender or whether you're trans or whatever it might be. Um, and then, um, and to think of that as primarily what you are. And then to be in a situation where you're seeing everything as an affront against you. And it's possible to, to I don't know what the right answer is on every debate that comes up about trans people, right? But it's possible to um, think about those from the perspective of somebody who um, is in the unenviable position of having, finding themselves not regarding themselves as the gender that everybody else thinks they are and that they were, you know, their anatomy would lead you to think they are. And trying to deal with that and sort out what to do in society and should they get a medical intervention or not and what bathroom should they... You can think of somebody who, from the perspective of, man, I'm in a real plight here. Um, what can I ask for from the rest of society to kind of help me deal with it and what, kind of, what would be respectful to me? That's a very different thing than um, the cis, whatever the equivalent of the word patriarchy is for cis you know, the cis patriarchy or whatever that's heteronormative and cis normative is uh, all stacked against me and my life is on it. Therefore, I have to tear it down. And it's the tear it down uh, motivation that I think is the, the problem. Thank you, Greg. Brenda. Yeah, I think um, Greg's example there actually, I think, demonstrated the point Nancy was making, which is that I do think something has changed. I think, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, we, we could and did have discussions just sticking with the trans issue for a moment we did have discussions about what was the what might be the desirable outcome for the individual and for society if there are people who feel that they are a different gender to the one they were born as or or, or they want to change gender and so on you know there was there was the space there was the, the common ground of politics in which that could be discussed um, is a medical intervention a good idea? Should it, be a, should it be a psychological intervention? What is this about? Where does it come from? All those questions were talked about. It's increasingly difficult to do that now because if you raise any questions whatsoever, you can lose your job. Um, you can be no platforms from British universities. You will be called transphobic if you raise any of these questions. Even if you suggest that it's a bad idea 
to prevent the onset of puberty in 13 and 14 year old boys and girls, you will be called transphobic, you will be accused of making people want to commit suicide. That is That issue speaks to, I think, a very important shift, which is the crumbling away of the common ground of politics and of understanding. Now, it's, saying common ground doesn't mean there was a g agreement and it was happy clappy. On the contrary, I think there were huge, massive political ideological divides in the past. Obviously, there was. Um, but there was the common ground of understanding that these issues were important, understanding that the differences of opinion were profound, and understanding that the best way to um, fix these things or to defeat one side with another side was through the common ground of political engagement and serious reasoned engagement. That, I think, is what has changed. Um, you know, obviously, things like the Khmer Rouge or the Holocaust, I don't think they come into this category because that those were um, incredibly irrational episodes. They, I don't think they fit into the kind of thing we're talking about, which is the point I would make is in the past, even when there have been massive, massive differences in ideology and outlook, there has always been a space for people to discuss that in a reasoned way. Uh, and when that space disappears, that's when you get conflict and war and, and so on and so forth. So if you think back to Karl Marx, Karl Marx's writings about Thomas Malthus, um, he wrote them off a few decades after Thomas Malthus wrote his stuff on population. I mean, you couldn't get two more different points of view about humanity. Um, Malthus believed in natural limits and thought that there was only a certain amount of stuff that we could produce and food that we could produce because he failed to foresee the Industrial Revolution because he had a limited mindset. Um, and when Marx was writing about him, he took his ideas incredibly seriously, even though he was putting something in uh, the polar opposite view, which is that the limits faced by humanity are political, uh, they're limits of the imagination and limits of production rather than limits of nature. I mean, that is fundamentally one of the most important political divides of modern times, and yet it was still possible to have that discussion. So I also think Nancy's example of environmentalism is a good one because Historically speaking, there have been discussions about whether humankind is confronted by natural limits or production limits, whether the problem is nature or, dare I say it, the capitalist mode of production. That's been a debate that's gone on for 200 plus years. Um, but uh, what happens now is that anyone who questions the idea of natural limits is a climate change denier, you should not be allowed onto the BBC. There are active campaigns to prevent such people from appearing on the national broadcaster. You won't be allowed to speak on certain university campuses. So there's been a shrinking of the space in which these profound ideological differences can be had out. And I think that's one of the problems that we face right now, which is, you know, these divides still exist in society, but very often one side in the debate feels that it cannot express itself. And that gives rise to what a sociologist has referred to as the spiral of silence, where you end up censoring yourself because you know that your opinions are no longer acceptable in the public sphere. So I think it's an incredibly destructive process. And the very interesting thing that Douglas Murray says in the Madness of Crowd books is that some of these topics are so complicated that they need more discussion. The transgender issue is the obvious thing that we don't, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. And the same would apply to energy. Anyway, like last week with Claire Fox, there's a lot of discussion on the chat about what is and what is not censorship. I promise you, I will answer, I will ask the difficult question to Brendan. But before that, let's go to another live question. Richard, unmute yourself. Richard. Okay, I got you. Yeah, so it was there was, yeah. there was a conflict of interest there. Um, I think, I mean, uh, outside uh, the realms of a poor taste joke, it's very difficult to imagine um, a Holocaust survivor ever being mates um, with a with a, a Nazi uh, prison camp warder. But at the same time, um, one should imagine that it's possible as human beings for us to um, forgive our, tor our our torturers, so to speak. And that we should be very careful. I think when when Nikos was asking himself quite validly, I think the question 
question about, you know, how can someone who's been on the opposite side of a of a conflict uh, ever be a friend with anyone, whether that's before, during, or or after? It's a it's an, it's an interesting question, but I think it's it does the very thing that we need to be careful of, which is it confuses the personal and the political. It, it, these things, uh, you know, the the nature of personal relationships, their, their intimate nature means that they are not always susceptible to the big narratives the big political narratives and we shouldn't try uh, we shouldn't try to make those things uh, uh, mesh together that it's 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 not a constructive way of approaching it i wanted to to make another point which is to do with uh, this book or the, a point that's made in this book which i thoroughly i'm reading at the moment which i thoroughly recommend matthew crawford's why we drive which has just come out and um he makes the point that there is a shift actually it's long before uh, what nancy was suggesting perhaps in in the 70s where he talks about the Geneva, I don't know if he's, he, if he's originating this, it, he may be quoting or looking at something Hannah Arendt said, um, but he, he talks about the fact that the Geneva Convention uh, that governs wars comes out of the idea that it's possible to have two different sets of opposing ideas and be passionate and uh, feel so strongly about them that you're prepared to shed your own blood and other people's blood over them, but that we, rem that, but it remains a political difference and a political uh, uh, point of view that, that is different. What shifts, or what seems to shift in, in the argument in the book, is um, after the Second World War, where it becomes about crimes against humanity, which means that there are good people and there are bad people. And that sort of relates back to, I think, what, what Brendan was, was suggesting in, in his introduction, that, that the shift actually happens, and this is where I was slightly disagreeing with him about the Holocaust, is that the shift happens with the Holocaust, that it becomes impenetrable to political analysis and, and, and impenetrable, it becomes something which is an entirely mental, well, uh, something which is not susceptible to human reason, whereas, you know, it is possible perhaps to rationalise it without forgiving it or, or apologising for it. And that that's the shift that happens. Of course, we can see that accelerates with the cre uh, creation of the International Court uh, for Human Rights and so on and so forth. That becomes a huge political trend uh, after the end of the Cold War. But it starts very much in those early uh, uh, post-war years, post-Second World War years with the Nuremberg trials and so on, where there becomes a very distinct division where there is the good political side and there is the bad political side. And it becomes a moral question no longer a fiscal question. That that was a point I wanted to make. That's a good. Uh, th this is a good question, Richard. And and Andrew mentions in the comments, is it that when you are friend with someone who is a real enemy, isn't this close to Stockholm syndrome? So anyway, so uh, Greg and Brendan, comments on on that. I think um, uh, on uh, well on on the Holocaust thing. Um, Obviously, uh, you, you know, reason can, do, can be deployed to understand the Holocaust, to explain it, to explain where it comes from, uh, the politics that gave rise to it and so on. But I think um, uh, the Holocaust, the reason I wanted to distinguish it from the kind of things we were talking about is because I do think it falls outside the realm of reason as an act in itself. Um, you know, war is what happens when politics fails. And I think the Holocaust is what happened when reason failed. And I think it has an incredibly irrational, uh, psychotic component to it, which I think means that it should be discussed separately to, for example, the Greek Civil War or the English Civil War or um, the Irish War of Independence or whatever else it might be. Those are all rational, reasoned expressions you know, um, war as, as the continuation of politics by other means, whereas the Holocaust absolutely does not fall into that category. War is, is uh, the Holocaust is, is, represents the ultimate collapse of reason. That doesn't mean we can't use reason and freedom of speech to talk about it and discuss it and analyze its origins and its impact. I think that's important, but I do think it's a particularly unique event, um, which is why, by the way, I've always been utterly implacably opposed to the kind of regressive idea that the Holocaust springs from the Enlightenment itself and is the high point of uh, human reason and, and science. I think that's one of the ugliest arguments of modern times. And if anyone in this discussion shares that view, it'd be interesting to hear what they, why they think so. Um, I think it's the opposite. I think it represents the negation of the Enlightenment and the negation of reason. So I think it's a distinctive event that's what I was saying in relation to that. But Richard, I agree with your 
broader point that there has been, and, and the Holocaust, or, or rather the aftermath of the Holocaust and the way it was institutionalized in Europe, um, uh, uh, many modern day European institutions spring from a reaction against the Holocaust, uh, particularly the commitment to human rights in Europe, which I think is an ironically illiberal worldview, or the European Union and various other uh, globalist bodies come from a reaction against the Holocaust. So I think um, you're absolutely right that there is a turning point uh, at some point relatively recently away from um, a, an understanding that you can disagree with someone but still see them as living within a certain realm of reason and engagement. And that's shifted to a new era in which all sorts of people simply for holding political points of view or moral points of view are denounced and written off as unacceptable, beyond the pale, ripe for cancellation and not worth engaging with. Um, I think numerous historical acts contributed to that shift, but I think that probably is the most important shift, in my view anyway, in relation to the questions of respect and judgment and the collapse of public debate. I think the most important thing has been that shift away from uh, a, a, a ground on which things could be talked about in a serious way, the collapse of that into a realm in which you're either good or bad and there's no, nothing else, that I think is a serious problem. Very quick follow-up for both, although I don't want to hijack the question, but very quickly, what do you make, Brendan, and i ask Greg also, about the Jordan Peterson claim that although events like the Khmer Rouge are unique and it's basically things going as bad as they can get. But how about the, the idea that the mindset of some of the people who are today protagonists in the council, in, in the culture wars is similar to the mindset and the worldview and the hate, hateful zeal of the, of the Khmer Rouge? Do, do you see any merit on this idea? Uh, I, um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily cite the example of the Khmer Rouge. I, I have compared cancel culture to Maoism, I think, um, uh, to, and particularly, sorry, to the Cultural Revolution in the late 60s. I think that's th that comparison is, is very warranted. I mean, the Cultural Revolution uh, it had many similarities to what is happening now, including the tearing down of statues, the banning of certain books, um, the war against people who had old fashioned views or outdated views or wrong views, particularly on university campuses, an extreme intolerance for um, the four olds. I can't remember what the four olds are now, but I think it was tradition and ideology and a couple of other things. Um, but that kind of deranged youthful intolerance for any form of thinking that runs counter to one's own uh, to such an extent that you will tear down statues, rip up books and and hit people across the head and make them wear signs in public simply because they have a different worldview than yours. I see echoes of that all the time these days. Uh, you know, a couple, a few years ago at the London School of Economics, um, there was some kind of um, rape culture scandal some uh, some um groups of young lads rugby lads and so on were judged to be disrespectful of women because they published oh no they were disrespectful of gays disrespectful of gays right so they they published some uh, magazine or literature that made fun of people and it was very striking that a few days later some of them were uh, agreed to undergo some form of i don't know re-education and some of them were standing outside the london school of economics holding placards saying um, a good lad is someone who respects homosexuals or a good lad is someone who respects women. And it, seeing those young men holding these kind of shame inducing placards outside of a university really in, brought to my mind the cultural revolution when they would hang signs around people's necks to uh, uh, bring people's attention to how wrong the person's views were. So I think there are comparisons. I think the Stasi is another good comparison. I think cancel culture is a snitch culture. You're always listening out for people at work who say the wrong thing and squealing them up to their employer, trying to get them sacked. I think the Stasi comparison is warranted too. Um, but I'm always slightly wary of making comparisons with genocidal regimes because I think that runs the risk of downplaying the seriousness of the genocidal regimes while exaggerating the problem of cancel culture. Uh, but I think it's worth looking at flashpoints of hysteria in history and how they find their echo in, in modern times. Yeah, Greg. 
I agree with um, with that comment of Peterson as, as you presented it. I haven't seen him uh, say that. But um, and I think in general, there's a lot more continuity between all of these kinds of phenomena than a lot of people think. And part of what I've been trying to do here is put an emphasis on that continuity. So let me do a corrective in case I've come off, um, you know, thinking there are no differences. So there are certainly issues and a lot of issues right now where it's a lot worse than it was, say, in the 90s or the late 80s. The kind of opprobrium um, J.K. Rowling is uh, facing uh, on on Twitter for saying, you know, whether they're right or wrong, fairly innocuous things and things like that. That wouldn't have happened 20 years ago. And it's bad that it's happening now. But I don't think that this is, you know, unprecedented or so strange. Uh, and if we look at the different historical periods, you find it, and in different places, you find this kind of collectivistic, knee-jerk, non-thoughtful, let's band together and throw out the outgroup rather than argue with them or reason with them um, and, and demonize them in a lot of different places. So we talk about um, post-World War II, uh, uh, Richard brought up, and post the Holocaust, and now this idea that we're switching from viewing things as uh, merely political differences to these uh, tremendous moral societal differences. I don't buy it. I don't buy that that change really happened after World War II in either way. Because so after World War II, we have the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is engaging in planned famines, killing millions and millions of people. And we have the UN where we have the, the UK and the US sitting across from them at the security table pretending that we have these political differences and it's kumbaya and we can talk and reason and negotiate and we're not in a kind of good and evil battle here. Now, of course, you have people in both countries who are viewing it as a good and evil battle, but we have these kind of institutions that treat it as a mere uh, political difference. And you have that going on before and after, you know, with the Nazis, with other places. So I think there's just two ways of viewing this that have coexisted uh, forever and have become, that is a moralized and a non-moralized way of viewing things. And I don't think people are very good at holding the moralized way view in a way that's non-hysterical. And so we get people unproductively acting on a moralized view or else downplaying morality and pretending it's all anemic differences of opinion. And then if you go before World War II, um, before the Cold War, I think you have large sections of US intelligentsia, of the American intelligentsia, and I think it was less so in the UK, but I'm not sure, where um, there was tremendous influence by the Soviets or by communists more generally. There was a lot of things that didn't get published because it was too negative on uh, negative on the USSR. Um, and things were just rejected out of hand because of that. And I'm sure there are a million times and places where there was some view that was in the ascendancy in some clique that had a kind of institutional status. And views that were different from it were written off, seen as beyond the pale, in the same way that views that we on this, many of us on this call think ought to be within the pale on climate change or on gender issues or whatever are, are now written off. So I don't, I think the issues uh, that this happens to changes. And I think if we look back to like the 80s and the 90s as the time since which things got worse, we're looking back to an unusually good time with respect to these issues. I think um, the USSR was now seen pretty uncontroversially as an evil empire. And um, the uh, worst excesses of the, the 1960s era new left were seen through. And the, the new religious right hadn't yet risen to the prominence that it would get. And so in a lot of different places in the 80s and 90s, there was a kind of greater sensibility than there had been before or since. So I have to go to Peggy's and Stephanie's discussion on and ask Brendan straightforward uh, the, the censorship issue. So the question is this, Brendan, I, very few would disagree with you that Twitter should get the moral condemnation for the way of a double standard. As you wrote today, I think on Spiked, if you say that someone who has a penis is a man, you get booted off Twitter, but if you say that the Jews are snakes, you get a slap in the hand for one week. Now, no disagreement here. The big question though is, how is this to be rectified, so to speak? 
Is it through public pressure, which is one position, or is it with the use of force by the state, which is basically the state saying Twitter, no matter whether you want Milo on Twitter, you have to have them. And wouldn't this constitute censorship? So that's the that's the that's the simple or not so simple question. Um, yeah, that's and it's an important question. I would obviously prefer public pressure, not least because I don't trust the modern state. The modern state doesn't believe in freedom of speech, um, particularly in the UK and other European states as well. So to ask the state to put pressure on Twitter or Facebook um, would be a non-starter, I think. Uh, but I think public pressure is needed because, uh, you know, my personal view, and this might be a little bit controversial, I, I think libertarians are not well prepared for the new climate of censorship. Because I think among some libertarian groups, particularly the ones I've debated in the US, um, there is a tendency to obsess so much over state power that you neglect other forms of power. And um, we all know from John Stuart Mill's On Liberty and from numerous other writers in history that state censorship is not the only form of censorship. There is also the tyranny of custom, the tyranny of wisdom, the social pressure to conform, um, the use of pressure in workplaces, the use of pressure in universities, uh, um, you know, all those kinds of things which have an incredibly real palpable impact on freedom of expression. And I think if we go down the route of saying that the only form of censorship is censorship that is carried out by the state, then we will miss out on all the new forms of censorship that are currently taking place, which is the willingness of workplaces to sack workers who have a problematic point of view, or the willingness of universities to prevent people from speaking on campus, which happened to me at Oxford University a few years ago. Um, now, everyone, some people supported me, but some of my libertarian friends said, well, this is Oxford University. It's the management of Oxford University. They can do what they want. Fine, I guess, technically speaking, that's true, but it still was a detriment to freedom of expression and to the desire of numerous students to engage in a political discussion. So I think, um, in my mind, censorship is, the, is any mechanism or uh, use of power or authority to restrict freedom of expression, and that can take various different forms. And I think um, it, it, my personal view, with it, and I say this as someone who, who comes from the left, I think the fetishization of property rights in relation to the freedom of speech question is a problem. Um, and it's gonna be a growing problem because private companies now dominate so much of political discourse. We've never had a time like this in history when private companies have been the means through which politicians engage with the public, through which political ideas are spread, through which ordinary people seek to hold politicians to account or to express themselves in a way they've never been able to do at any other time in history. When private companies are so thoroughly involved in that process, I think we are on a hiding to nothing if we say that those private companies' property rights override every other concern. So I do think we need a really serious discussion about this. And I think we all have to be willing to shake our heads a little bit and to um, maybe disavow things we might have said in the past or rethink things we've said in the past in the interests of creating as free a culture as possible. Because at the moment, the state still censors people, the state still imprisons people. In, in the UK, people have been um, fined by the state for making jokes or imprisoned by the state for saying racist things on Twitter. That's an outrage, that's a, an abomination. But the, the dominant form of censorship now is more informal. And I think we need to find new ways to tackle that. So I don't want this to be the sole focus of today because there are more people waiting, but Greg, uh, give us your take on this. Yeah, I think John Stuart Mill really screwed up the discussion of freedom of speech. I don't think he's for freedom of speech, as I understand it, um, precisely because he conflates uh, under the two kinds of power, if you want to call them that, uh, political power and economic power that Brendan's talking about. Um, 
That said, I also think there's a lot of wisdom in John Stuart Mill about the value of engaging with contrary opinions in a marketplace of ideas. And I think it's really important to solve the problems that we're facing now, which include literal censorship, which I think can only be done by a government, and I'll say a bit more about why I think that, and another phenomena that I think people like Brendan are right to be concerned about, about workplaces, universities, having unduly narrow speech codes. But I think in order to solve the problem, it's important to distinguish them and not treat them as one problem. Um, so I think the way that you can suppress speech through a government, through government force, is fundamentally and deeply different than the things any private company can do, however much alleged power it has. And I think always uh, speech has been spread primarily through private companies, except for the brief period when the government, well, controlled the airways. But um, the, uh, that is the decades when that was true. Um, the, what, there's an old socialist slogan that what socialism is about is democratizing the means of production, right? But democratizing something is precisely making it subject to mob rule, to majority rule. And there are certain things that should be subject to majority rule, um, uh, within certain parameters, who is administrating certain laws. Um, you know, I think it's really important to have representative, which means majority government on certain things within certain principles. But who gets to say what is not one of those things. And insofar as the government is controlling uh, what the speech policies are of universities, which unfortunately they do in some cases, too many cases, of social media companies, which is what a lot of people want the government to do and so forth, uh, both on the right and left in America and I believe in the UK too, and so on and so forth, the more that is subject to a kind of um, mob rule to which mob rule enforced by literal force to which there's no way to make an exception for yourself. When it's the most popular newspaper or the most popular social media company um, has a certain policy and there are a group of people who are excluded from that policy, whether it's 10 percent of people or 20 or 5 or whatever, there are means for them, so long as they're legally allowed to do it, to organize some kind of alternative channel. And we see that happening with Twitter and with Facebook and so forth. People go on Parler or this other sh thing and, you know, Dave Rubin and all these people and Sam Harris object to what um, Patreon did and they start alternatives. and. Uh, now, none of those alternatives have been very successful yet, but also all those people still have platforms. So um, political freedom gives you outlets to create alternatives when private agencies behave in ways that you don't think they should and that don't advance your interests. But what I think we need to conceptualize better is what the wrong way of acting is other than forcibly shutting people up. And it's having what? Is it having bad speech codes? Well, no, because I think it's having speech codes that might be perfectly appropriate for certain kinds of organizations or certain kinds of contexts. If you're the, you know, um, transgender advocacy league or whatever, and you get together to talk about um, how to promote your vision of trans rights, and that's what your goal is, then it makes perfect sense that if um, J.K. Rowling comes into your group and says what she says on Twitter, you might want to think, no, we have our view of this issue and you're out of here. You're not one of us. But if you're you know, a major national newspaper or your Twitter or you're some organization that's supposed to be and you see your purpose as and you market yourself as a forum for the kind of arguments and ideas of moment in our society today, well, that's not consistent with... Um, with uh, throwing out everybody who holds that view. And then you run into the kind of issues that I think Mill was rightly concerned about. Whereas if you create an environment where such a limited range of opinions are expressed that you're not hearing the opposite of the opinions you hold, or you're only hearing them in super curated ways from people who like give you the catechism, give you the response to the catechism and the response to that, and you're never actually engaging with, with um, your ideological opponent, so to speak, on these issues, you are really doing yourself a disservice as well as doing them a disservice. So anybody, whatever your ideology, if you are this issue on trans or this issue on gay rights or this issue on racism or this, whatever you, you have, you should value there being forums where you're hearing the alternative view, where those arguments are being put forward. You should value forums for open debate and free expression. 
and you should want there to be some in your society and you should support there being some in your society. And if, if a certain web service says, you know, we want to be family friendly or whatever, and therefore we're restricting our view to this, fine, so long as there are other ones that don't and if that, that are more open. And if there are none that are open to that kind of debate in your society, I think you should be stressing that this is an important value. We want to have it here. And we want to know for different companies, are you a platform for this or not? And if you are, then we want to hold you by boycotts, by demands as customers, to the standard of having intelligible rules for what's allowed and what's not allowed that are fair to all the different members of the debates and so forth. And if you say you're not, we're going to be a niche specialty platform that's a curated garden. Okay, fine. We're going to go elsewhere for our um, you know, debating needs. So, Brennan, very, very quickly, if possible, within 30 seconds, and then we go to Josephine. Uh, uh, just very briefly, I, I, I think I agree with uh, uh, some of what Greg said there, but I, I also, when I was listening to him, I think I, I got a glimpse of one of the fundamental contradictions at the heart of libertarianism, I think, which is this wariness about mob rule or, or, or majority rule. I, I'm hugely in favour of majority rule in as many areas of life as possible. Um, I'm a bit of a radical Democrat in that sense. But I think one of the, the reason that raises a contradiction or a problem for libertarians, and I'd be interested to hear people's view on this, is because I think it, it, it implicitly means that they often find themselves relying on the state or certainly on constitutional law to uphold what they consider to be important values, particularly freedom of speech. And I've had this debate with friends of mine in the United States numerous times where free speech campaigners who I know and admire enormously find themselves becoming over-reliant on constitutional law, which of course is overseen by the state, because they have an innate concern or suspicion of the mob or the majority of people. And so it, the state becomes a crutch for libertarianism, which I've always found deeply ironic and quite concerning. Uh, whereas I would argue that um, there is not an inherent contradiction between freedom and democracy. And in fact, they go hand in hand very well. And I would far rather trust the people to defend freedom than the state because the state is powerful and jaundiced and has a long history of uh, preventing the expression of certain views. Uh, so I, I do think um, I would encourage uh, the libertarian worldview to be more open to the democratic worldview rather than um, almost by default falling back on the state and the constitution to preserve certain freedoms. Just let me repeat something that Greg has worked on, something that really helped me understand these issues. That book that Greg edited and was out last year, The Foundations of a Free Society, and also there it becomes clear the difference between the objectivists and the libertarians in various issues. But anyway, Brenna, we've opened a can of worms on that. Let's go to the to the follow-up questions. Every time, like last week with Claire, we said the same. We need to have a, a one big debate where objectivists and, and radical Democrats who believe in freedom have a big, big, big discussion, but this cannot be today. So, Josephine, unmute yourself and... Oh, or do I need to unmute you? Hi You're there, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, uh, going on from what we're talking about, um, what Greg was just saying about um, groups having codes, I think one of the problems today is how those codes are interpreted. Um, obviously, we've just had in England the Wiley thing, where he went on a rant for I don't know how long about um, Jews, uh, um, Brendan referred to calling them snakes. And most people looked at his tweets and thought, whoa, he's lost it. He's off his rocker, he's on drugs or he's drunk. Um, he didn't really need to be taken down because most people could see he was just talking rubbish. Um, but obviously there's a big Twitter storm and we've now got a 48 hour walk off Twitter um, to show respect. I mean, the man was completely racist, I get that, but I think most intelligent people could see that and would not have agreed with him. One of the things that I was interested in was this whole personal as political thing because um, I, I think I raised this as an example last time we spoke about this. Um, my, my sister tried to put something on a Facebook page about trying to get schools reopened in her area. It was a local Facebook page for Hitchin. 
And um, they said, no, that you can't put that on because it's political. And um, she said, but you've had Black Lives Matters being discussed all weekend on here and there's been big arguments. And they said, yeah, but that's not political. And that, for me, that was a real shock. Um, but I think that actually does lead into some of the problems we're facing because it's not so much for me that the personal is political, although I, I see what you're saying, it's that political has become personal. So you've got this identity politics meshing with actually what are big narratives, should be big narratives. Anti-racism should be a big discussion, a big political discussion, but it's being closed down because it's being made personal. And then the problem is that it then divides even more because you know, if you're Indian, maybe you're not suffering as much as if you're West Indian or whatever. And because of that, the language then changes because they, they've taken it off the political agenda so it becomes moralized language, which is, I think, where the screeching starts and, you know, the, the personal insult to you. Um, you know, as a working class girl, if people say you haven't suffered as much as black people, I think, yes, I bloody have, because it's personal to me, you know. So I, I do understand why it is, um, it's a problem for them. But I think um, what for me is horrible is that this kind of um, creeping um, um, expansion of places that you can't discuss things so you know this woman saying this is a political so then we get reading lists for schools um, I'm sure that in America it's a different situation but over here um, it really has felt like you're not allowed to discuss it it's off the agenda politically and I think that might be part of the problem that we're why it's such a moralized discussion thank you who wants to jump in um, I, I agree with a lot of what Josephine has said, and I think um, particularly with the fact that not only has the personal become political, but the political has become personal. I think there's a lot of, in, there's a lot of interlinking between those two phenomena. Uh, but I've noticed that as well with Black Lives Matter, and it's incredibly difficult to have a reasoned discussion about Black Lives Matter and what it represents and whether it's doing the right thing and whether those riots and protests were the right approach and whether pulling down statues is sensible, all those things become increasingly difficult because personal um, hurt is marshaled to silence certain political criticisms. And that, that is a recurring situation. And, and I often fall into the same trap that Josephine says she falls into where I say, well, I come from a particular background, so doesn't that matter as well? Which is probably not helpful but I think it is uh, quite an instinctive response on the part of numerous people in, in this era. Um, but I think the, 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 the Black Lives Matter thing is a good example of the kind of thing I'm talking about, which in, in terms of what often seems like um, an, an invisible pressure to conform. Uh, and I do think it's worth thinking about how this comes about and how it can be tackled. So um, Greg says that, um, you know, censorship can only be carried out by the state. Now, in a sense, I, I kind of agree with that in a sense, because the state has extraordinary power in a way that even a workplace doesn't, although a workplace can ruin your life by sacking you. Uh, and even a university doesn't, even though it does have power. The state has an extraordinary amount of power. It can put you in jail. It can deprive you of freedom. It can deprive you of your basic rights. So when it silences you, and makes you pay it money because you expressed an opinion or puts you in jail because you expressed an opinion, that's incredibly serious and everyone should take that seriously. But there is something else. And I think the other thing is becoming more pronounced and more problematic in this era, which is this imperceptible pressure to say the right thing. And Black Lives Matter is a good example of that. We had, everyone was taking the knee Everyone was bowing down, even people who didn't really agree with it. Um, Dominic Raab, the foreign secretary in the UK, got into a huge amount of trouble because he said, I'm not going to take the knee because it's a, it's a symbol of subjugation and I won't do it. And everyone went crazy, which then expresses to the population at large that you shouldn't raise any criticisms. And I think the JK Rowling thing is a, is a similar example. JK Rowling is, she's uncancelable in a sense. She's too big to cancel because She's not just an individual, she's a global institution. You can't cancel her, which makes the trans lobby incredibly angry, in fact. But that's not the point. The point of the uh, visceral hatred aimed at JK Rowling is actually there's a target beyond the target. 
And the target is the population at large. And what it says to everyone else is, if you say this stuff, now she'll survive it because she's worth 750 million pounds and she's very famous and she's established, but you won't survive it. The ordinary woman who works in a university or, or, the, or the black lesbian who's currently uh, being threatened with uh, being sacked by her law chambers because she doesn't believe that men can become women you won't survive it. So the, the message echoes and ripples across the population more broadly. So we do have to think, and I think Black Lives Matter is, is useful in this example, we do have to think about how the pressure to conform works. We have to think about the impact it has. And we have to think about the fact that in my view, at least, it is probably one of the most problematic forms of censorship today. And I think it's worth untangling all that stuff and working about how working out how we can speak as freely as possible. Yeah. By the way, can I can I add, uh, Greg? Before you answer it, sorry to. Could you think of a word rather than censorship? Because I agree with you that this is not censorship that describes this suffocating atmosphere. Is there any other? Is there a term that would be more accurate but would also capture what is happening? Something like narrow-minded, um, stifling, um, but yeah, I don't, I've been trying to think of what the best term is, and I don't have an ideal one. All right. Um, let me two comments on um, what transpired between uh, Josephine and Brendan. A lot of what both of you said, I agree with, but just maybe two things that might add some, you know, additional thoughts or clarification. Um, first, when we talk about the relationship between the personal is the political. There are a couple of different things we might note. So my understanding of the or original meaning of that slogan, the personal is political, is that, uh, and I might be wrong about this, but this is what I think of the feminist having meant and so forth uh, back in the 70s, is, um, you know, you say you're for this cause, uh, equality for women, but what are you doing in your personal life for? You know, you go home and cook your husband's meal, um, and you shouldn't do that. You should... <coughs> way your personal relationships are it be, uh, as embodying the political ideals you stand for and, and so forth. Um, and so there, there's that. You, you have a political ideal. Are you reshaping your personal relationships around it? And probably most of us think, well, in some cases you shouldn't, in some you shouldn't, it depends, and so forth. Um, another thing it could mean is the thing that, that Brendan picked up on from what I said earlier about it, which is you have a political view and it becomes really important to you personally and so you join a club and it becomes a part of your identity that you're a you know exiteer or may i forget the british slogan or a, you know a tory or whatever it is um the third thing though that the one that i'm more for when i speak about pers that your political value should be expressions of what's personal is <clears throat> oh and then sorry there's another thing which is the using some personal experience as a cudgel or or in an argument i'm a working class person so don't you tell me i'm a black man so don't you tell me i'm a lesbian this so don't you tell me what it's like for me but there's a more if you approach politics as i'm a person and you're a person and my political convictions come from wanting as a person to lead a good life and be in a situation where I can. And I expect that that's true of you too. And now let me tell you about some of the problems I'm having, I think because of my race or gender or whatever it is uh, in the political conviction where you don't treat and, and you think about politics that way. Here's me and my personal life and here's what I want out of my personal life. And here's how politics flows from that. I think that's really healthy, and I think that that's also the healthy way to talk about um, racial injustice, gender injustice, any kind of injustice around what are called the density issues, where you not using it as a cudgel or saying you could never understand because you're not like me, but just let me fill you in on why this matters to me, on why I'm concerned about policing in my neighborhood, uh, either as someone who thinks there's not enough police or thinks there's too much or the wrong kind or whatever. The other topic is on the um, are there views you can't say right um, without repercussions well one thing that the people defending um, against for the people responding to the Harper's letter for example will point out and there's some truth to it is there have always been things you can't say um, there have always been things you can't say without professional repercussions and some of them we probably all think 
it's good that you can't say them without professional repercussions uh, and repercussions across your life, like, you know, um, some advocacy of, you know, promoting child molestation. There's got to be something that we think, yeah, if someone said this, they ought to get fired for it, or I would fire them, or I wouldn't want to work with them. So there have always been ideas like that. And what some people are saying is what's happened now is that um, some ideas that used to be unsayable in polite society, like, say, cancel the police or abolish the police, are now you feel more comfortable saying. And other ones that, um, that uh, used to, people used to be comfortable saying, like, you know, you can't be a woman if you have a penis or whatever, it's now become, um, you know, no one can say. Um, all right, maybe that's true. What things can't be said without facing repercussions has changed. Uh, and that's all that's happened. But it's not quite all that's happened. Because I think what's happened is it's changed in a way that ahead of or out of line with the actual views that people hold. So it's become that what like 30 or 40 or 50 percent of people think or 70 percent of people think is held by a relatively small contingent to be unthinkable and unsayable as a kind of political or rhetorical strategy. And I think that's part of what's going on now with the, the gangs uh, going after people who say things that everybody thought 10 years ago about trans people, whether again, whether they're right or wrong, um, that that as a kind of rhetorical political strategy has taken hold quickly. And most of us don't have experience with that kind of thing. I don't before. Um, I'm concerned about it, but I'm less concerned about it than maybe some are because I don't think it can last. I think the only thing that could happen as a result of that is a massive backlash. And I'm concerned about the strategy and the backlash kind of in one breath, um, rather than just being concerned about the strategy. I'm, you know, there are plenty of things I think I could imagine someone trying to cancel me for. That's been true way before this, uh, and it's true now too. But what seems like a new development to me is that things that most people think uh, people are now trying to get canceled for. And um, I worry about that, but I also worry about the response to it. Like I worried about the white privilege narrative in, the, in 2014, 15, when that started to be a big thing to say, or 13, whenever it was, um, that the result of that was going to be more explicit racism on both sides, not a diminution of it. And I think we've seen that happen in America, at least. Um, and I think that that's true here with this censoriousness or whatever you want to call it. So we go to read and then I'll ask the last question, church privilege and all that stuff. Read. Let me, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah. Can you hear me? We can hear you indeed. Okay, uh, I have a couple questions, but I guess I'll just ask one of them. Um, so I agree that you can have friends and associate with people with whom you have disagreements, but I'm curious about sort of what in practice that looks like, because it feels like they're still, even if I like say like, oh, I have a disagreement with you, there's still sort of an issue here. So like, I just came up with a couple examples that are kind of extreme, like Let's say I have a friend and I know they're very left wing, but I've like thought that it's just within bounds where I can tolerate it. And then one day, all of a sudden they come out and say something really extreme. Like they say, like maybe like Stalin got a really bad rap or something. And I'm very surprised by this and sort of like, or just other examples. Maybe I find out one of my friends was like in the KKK 14 years ago, but they say they've reformed and they're completely different or like, let's say I'm a trans person and these issues are really important to me and then JK Rowling starts saying things or someone starts saying more extreme things that I think are offensive. And like just maybe canceling might not be like the way we're handling right now might not be the healthy way, but sort of what is a more healthy way to handle those situations where someone is saying something that makes me kind of start to question them in this sort of way? Very good question. Who wants to jump in first? Well, I think um, in in response to Reed, I think the first the first thing is that we all need is some perspective. So you you have just talked about people who defend Stalin in the same breath as 
J.K. Rowling saying that there's such a thing as human biology. Now, I'm not saying that to to necessarily diss on you, but I think this kind of thing does happen quite a lot where um, we conflate numerous different things. Now, my view is that everyone should be free to say every, anything they want. And I would defend the freedom of speech of left wing people to stand up for Stalin, despite the fact that he was a uh, ruthless dictator. I'm I'm far more on the side of Trotsky than Stalin, but let's not get into that right now, because that would be far too difficult. Uh, but I would defend the right of people to do that. Um, and I would defend the right of J.K. Rowling to say that um, if you have a male body, you shouldn't be allowed into a rape crisis centre. But I think the f one of the starting points for this discussion has got to be perspective, and they are very different things. Defending Stalin, in my view, is immoral and outrageous and deeply problematic, whereas saying that male-bodied people shouldn't go into a rape crisis centre, I completely agree. So I do think we need to have some perspective. And then in terms of how we respond, that, that will then follow on from the perspective. So if our perspective is that it's that J what JK Rowling is saying is actually fine and legitimate, but some people will disagree, then you will have a reasoned discussion about that, I hope. If our starting point with the left-wingers defending Stalin is that this is outrageous and bizarre, um, then you might disagree in a more heated way, you might disagree in a more intemperate way, you might disagree in a more conflictual way. But I do think we need to have perspective before we can have freedom and before we can have discussion. Um, but I think the... Um, Following on from that, just briefly, I wanted to come back to something that Greg was touching on earlier, which is this idea that there's all that we know that the people who responded to the Harper's letter, one of the things that they said is that there have always been things that are unsayable, and we all know that. See, I have a slight problem with that because, you know, one of the one of the uh, uh, popular phrases of our era is that freedom of speech has consequences. So uh, people will often criticize, people criticize the Harper's letter signatories and they will often criticize people like me and I'm sure they've criticized people like you too. They will often say, well, you can have freedom of speech but that doesn't mean freedom from consequences. And my argument is, well, what do you mean by consequences? Because in my view, the only consequence that f speech should have is more speech. And if the consequence to the expression of an idea is that you lose your job or you are no platformed from a university or you are slaughtered at your desk at the Charlie Hebdo offices in Paris, if, that's the if, if those are the consequences to your expression of an idea, then I do want freedom from those consequences. And I do think we should argue from freedom, uh, for freedom from those consequences. And the only consequence the expression of an idea should have is the expression of an alternative idea. That's it. I completely oppose the sacking of people for their political points of view. I completely oppose the no platforming of people. I completely oppose the banning of people from Twitter. And of course, I know we all oppose the murder of people for what they say. Those are all consequences that have sprung from people's expression of their opinions over the past five to 10 years. Um, I do think we have to move into a situation where we argue for this very controversial thing, apparently, we argue for um, freedom from consequences, except the single consequence of disagreement or ridicule, anything that involves words. But if the consequence is something beyond words, the loss of a job, the loss of a livelihood, the loss of a life, we should absolutely oppose that because those are not really consequences. Those are forms of censorship or violence or intolerance that are designed to silence people. So um, uh, I think we do have to be slightly careful when we say that there have always been things that are unsayable because if we are devoted to the ideology of freedom of speech, and I do think we should be, then we should question the idea that anything should be unsayable and we should defend the right to to express the unexpressible idea precisely because it's always on the outskirts of acceptability that censorship first takes hold. By the way, you've answered my what would be my last question, which is what you would be, do with wireless rant. 
if you are, let's say, a sponsor. So difficult. Anyway, uh, we're, publishing, we're publishing a piece on Spike tomorrow uh, in defense of Wiley's right, Wiley's right to rant about Jewish people. Right. No, no, I'm sure I'm sure you I'm sure you you defend the right. But I mean, are you I mean, let's say, him? you know, Tom, Tom Slater bumps his head somewhere and loses it and starts writing horrible stuff. Like, you know, at, at that point, you say, OK, look, OK, you should have your freedom, but I don't want anything to do with you. So shouldn't the sponsor, let's say, of, of Wiley? Yes, absolutely. I mean, Tom Slater would never do anything like that, as you know, Nikos. But um, yes, you're right. I think um, people around Wiley, his um, manager, his, his record producer, they absolutely have the right to say, we don't want to be associated with you. But in terms of platforms and in terms of the public arena, I do think we have to defend his right to be in those arenas because, precisely because bigotry is never defeated by censorship. In fact, bigotry is often worsened by censorship. France is a very good example of this. France outlawed Holocaust denial 25 years ago. The state, the French state, made it illegal to deny the Holocaust. France now has one of the worst problems in Europe with anti-Semitism and with Holocaust denial. I, I don't think the censorship is the sole reason for that, but I think it's a contributing factor where if you outlaw these bigoted ideas, you tend to make them seem more exotic and dangerous and sexy to certain sections of society. Censorship is never the answer to bigotry. So you're right, people have the right to walk away from Wiley, reject him, turn their backs on him. But in terms of public platforms, I think it would be in all of our interests if we defend his right to stay on those platforms. What if the people who want to turn away from him and turn their back on him and have nothing to do with him happen to be his employers at the moment? Then he can't be fired on your view? I would, I would err on the side of not doing that. And what does it mean to their freedom of speech if they're not allowed to disassociate from somebody who, uh, who says things that they regard as horrible? I mean, uh, this is why I think this is a real difference. And I don't think what you're talking about uh, when you talk about freedom from employment consequences, from other kinds of consequences, is freedom of speech. Um, but this is, I think this is a big topic. What is freedom and what isn't? And um, maybe there should be a whole, a whole session just on that topic. But I want to speak to Reed's initial question, uh, or go back to it. I mean, you, start, you spoke to it already. Um, and I agree uh, that there is a, a real lack of in putting together um, someone who loves Stalin uh, uh, or for that matter, someone who loves Trotsky, which I think is uh, better than Stalin, but still, you know, doesn't earn points in my book uh, with um, with what J.K. Rowling said. And I particularly was offended by the idea of if you're a trans person, how are you going to react to J.K. Rowling thinking this? Because this assumes that all trans people have the same view of what she said. And being trans doesn't mean that you have the same view about exactly what policies different organizations should have to trans people as every other person. Um, I mean, does Deirdre McCluskey have the same? I mean, what does she think of J.K. Rowling? I have no idea. Um, so it, it's really, um, you know, we shouldn't assume that all people who are black agree with some guy because he speaks for says he speaks for black people or all people who are working class agree with some party that claims to you know agree with labor or whatever um people are individuals they have their own views and people who claim to speak for every gay person every white person every black person are wrong they're not they're you know um but so but go back to the issue of you're someone who's really offended by what jk rowling said whether you're trans straight gay cis whatever you're someone who thinks Stalin's evil and you found out that your you know, guy you play tennis with you know, has a Stalin tattoo or whatever. Um, how should you react? Well, I think some factors to think about, and I'll give you some personal examples, uh, but some factors to think about. First of all, some of your examples involved past behaviors. This guy was in the Ku Klux Klan. He was a whatever, uh, voted for this guy last year, whatever it was. Um, one thing you want to know is, well, how do they now think about that thing? And um, have they changed? And there are questions about, are there things you could never come back from? Uh, you know, some concentration camp guard who now feels bad about it. Maybe you think, well, no, that's something you couldn't come back from. But someone who voted for a guy you didn't like five years ago, and now he's, man, I shouldn't have voted for him. That's not the same as someone who's, you know, cheering for Corbyn now or whatever it is. 
if you think Corbyn was bad. Okay. Um, so first, I think differentiate past and present and think about the present and also think about how much do you think someone could change. Then for present views, I think you want to think about how important is this thing? One, do I think the person is morally wrong here or just mistaken? For either answer, answer how important is this to who the person is? And how relevant is it to the relationship that I'm going to want to have with this person? Like, is this person the checkout person at the grocery store? My relationship with him is super minimal. We maybe smile or exchange some pleasantries while he's doing the bags. And I find out that he um, has horrible views on race by my situation. Yeah, I think it would be weird and wrong for me to then go and complain to the grocery store to, to try to get rid of this guy or something, uh, to try to cancel him. Um, uh, if he's actively, you know, a night rider in the KKK, then I think it, or thinks people should be, maybe then I should do that. Um, but if he's, you know, someone who I'm hiring to watch my kids and I don't want these views aired around them, or I think it, it really um, shows something about his character that makes me question whether I should want him to be around my kids, that's very different. Am, is he somebody that I we like the same sports team and we meet and talk about sports stats in the bar or whatever, then I think, you know, unless his views are so onerous that I think, you know, he's just the essence of this guy is he's an evil person, then, you know, probably it doesn't matter to me that much. But if it's someone I'm going to marry, it matters a lot more. Even small differences, uh, have, you know, have a, a bigger impact when it's someone that's supposed to. You really have to think about what is the view of the person how close am I to them and how is it relevant? And I'll give an example. I um, am really opposed to the, the Occupy movement. I thought it was not a good movement. Uh, I thought particularly the people um, involved in Occupy New York, they were occupying a private park that belonged to somebody. They were basically stealing that guy's property for months on end. They were disrupting the perfectly reasonable activities of people trying to do it. And I think it's wrong and bad. And I think that they should have been arrested and, you know, fined or jailed for trespass for part of the time that they were there and you know they um whatever so i had a, a really negative view of that movement um for a while you know years after it happened i i was uh playing at a jam session and i met a guy who was a part of the occupy movement i mean was occupying one of these parks or whatever and we had some tastes in music in common and we played together in a band for a little while and we also had some interests um had both read some of the same books and we talked about them and argued about politics that guy wasn't a close friend. He's not a best friend. You know, he's not someone who I think of as my bosom buddy or whatever. But I had pleasant interactions with him in that context. Um, if he was a member of the Manson family, I couldn't have done that, right? Um, and there's a kind of closeness that I couldn't have had with him while we still had that kind of disagreement. And I think these are kind of things, you know, you have to think about with a sense of proportion. But it's, it's not just a proportion of how bad the thing is that you think they hold, but um, other things. One, how unusual is that badness? Does he hold a view that you think is really bad, but practically everybody else holds it because you're a real radical? Well, then you're not going to judge this guy in particular as you know some evil bastard. You're going to say the whole society is screwed up. This guy is typical of it. Um, so that's one thing. And then another is what is your relationship with the person going to be like? And depending on the scale and type of relationship, how much and what kinds of differences of opinion and from what your view might even be character flaws are tolerable. Thank you both. And I have to say as a final word that as someone who used to be an apologist for Stalinism and who actually my birthday is the anniversary of Trotsky's assassination, I'm so glad that the way I changed my views is not by someone canceling me, and I'm glad there were no social media back then, but by reading stuff, including stuff in Spiked, and changing my mind through ideas and not through someone ruining, uh, ruining my life. Anyway, uh, many thanks to both speakers. Razi, will you do the, out, the proper outro? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, thanks as well for me to both our speakers and to Nikos. Uh, with Nico's chairing, I, I got to read some of the chat. And uh, Stephanie, I, I agree with your, I, I like your plan, but I have to say, I have a similar plan. You know, 
be a, a full-time objectivist and nobody's canceling you. Uh, but if, if only you knew how frequently Nikos threatens to cancel me, you'll, you'll know that's not, a, <laughs> that's not a guarantee of anything. So much so that I actually had to uh, ask his permission to make even that comment. Um, uh, a couple of other things. So next Monday, uh, we'll be back. Um, it, I haven't posted the event yet. Uh, there are a few other um, things that need to be finalized, but the speaker is uh, Dr. Gina Gorlin, and the topic will be something on psychology. I will uh, give more information soon. I think the objectivists in the audience uh, will already be there having heard that. And those of you who don't know Gina Gorlin, you have a week to look her up. Uh, Wednesday, two days from now, part one of a two-part discussion of the objectivist ethics uh, with Dr. Andrew Bernstein. And tomorrow on the Daily Objective, the, the, uh, our Facebook Live weekday show hosted by uh, usually Nikos and another co-host, Rucka, Gloria Alvarez, uh, or Josh Dixon. Tomorrow we have a real life hero um, as the guest on the show. Businessman Simon Dolan, who has been standing up to lockdown, uh, to the lockdown, has been challenging it uh, in court. Unfortunately, was unsuccessful with that challenge because that's sometimes how it goes. But uh, yeah, I, I strongly encourage you to uh, to watch that. And if you enjoy our content, I also encourage you to consider uh, becoming a member and posting the, the link in. Uh, sorry, let me say one thing. I'll say it every time we have Brendan, but I think it's a big thing. When we had that discussion with him challenging the lockdown, we were literally the first spiked ourselves and Hitchens were the only three people slash institutions in late March who dared say something about lockdown. So, you know. Yeah. And, and speaking, of, speaking of things you wanted to cancel me over, Nikos, the, the title for that event was something we argued about. We wanted, I, I wanted, is tyranny coming? And then I changed it at some point to say, uh, to, to the question, is tyranny here? Uh, and it, it definitely, uh, definitely in the early days of lockdown, it was like living in uh, something that we had only previously heard of. So uh, we will be continuing to fight uh, against tyranny in, in any form. And uh, if you want to join us in that, uh, that fight, the link to join the membership, our website uh, is under construction, but the membership page is still up. So you can still become a member. Uh, and, you know, we, uh, we, neither practice nor preach uh, self-sacrifice. And I know this is not the easiest time financially for many people. So if the membership is out of your reach, uh, you can definitely help us in other ways, like sharing these events. Uh, we are, we're on, you know, th this event is, gonna, is now on Facebook. It's gonna be on YouTube and uh, a bunch of podcast platforms in a few days. So uh, share it, like, subscribe, um, follow and all that stuff. And uh, thanks again, everybody, for joining us. And we'll see you hopefully in a couple of days. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.